We've been talking about Kobe Bryant for the last couple of weeks. The fact that he passed away with his uh, beautiful young daughter, his 13-year-old daughter, Gianna, who really didn't get a chance to live her life, and all the people that died in that helicopter. And we all know the situation. You know, I, I understand that Vanessa Bryant wanted to have his funeral at the Staples Center where all the fans and all the players can go and meet and celebrate the greatness of what Kobe Bryant not only did for basketball, but did for Lakers basketball and throughout the world and, and really promoting the game of basketball as one. And a lot of people showed up, guys like Stephen Curry, Clay Thompson, everybody. Russell Westbrook was there. Every single big superstar, Dwayne Wade was there. LeBron James, I think, was there as well. Everybody was there. Jack Nicholson was there. I mean, it was pretty amazing who showed up and what type of people showed up. It wasn't just the superstar basketball players, but it was the fans. The fans that grew to love this kid from the age of 18 when he was drafted by the Charlotte Hornets. And then <laughs> traded to the Lakers for Lottie Divac. And really listening to Vanessa Bryant and her speech, her 22-minute speech of her daughter, Gianna, and not having a chance to walk her down when she gets married and be a, a grandmother to her children, it's really sad. And it, to me, if you didn't cry or you didn't shed a tear on listening to anything who ever spoke at that wake, and I didn't get to watch the whole thing. I listened to Michael Jordan, which we have a clip of Michael Jordan. I listened to some of Kobe Bryant's friends. Obviously, the GM of the Lakers, who was his agent his whole career, his 20-year career. And really, Kobe Bryant was the reason and one of the reasons why he got that GM job from the Lakers, from Magic Johnson. But it saddens me not only that the fact that you're not going to get to see this guy play, see this guy grow, maybe as a coach in the NBA because he, he loved to coach. He loved to coach his daughter, and his, his daughter wanted to be a professional basketball player, a women's basketball player. And she wanted to, young girls to look up to her. For what she has done, not because of what her father was, but what she was, an individual athlete. And you think of Kobe Bryant. I respect who Kobe Bryant was as an athlete. I respect what Kobe did for the game of basketball at the time that he did it. The dominance of Shaquille O'Neal and the Lakers and Kobe Bryant and all the teams, the championship teams that they had with Phil Jackson was absolutely amazing. And even though I rate him on my chart as 17 out of the top 20 players in NBA history, that doesn't take away his greatness. That doesn't take away where he is in the record books as a point scorer, which he's third all time. Well, fourth all time. Fourth now, yeah. Now with LeBron James passing him the day before he passed away. But what he is as a father, as a representative of the NBA and the game of basketball as a whole. 41 years this man has been on this earth. 41 great years. 20 of them were in the NBA. Could you imagine you're on this earth for 41 years? In 20 years of your life, you were an NBA basketball player and one of the top basketball players in the world. Throughout the week last week, there were conversations. Obviously, everybody knows who's going to be the number one pick in Burroughs. And Burroughs was not really working out at the combine. No, no he's going to throw it his pro day. Yeah, so they measured his hand, which is nine inches, which is one of the biggest hands in NFL history. You look at this kid. The kid is built like an ox. The guy's got size. He's got ability. He's a pure pocket quarterback, which a lot of NFL teams love and has loved over the years. But as you know, the quarterback position has completely changed. And now when you look at the quarterback position, you need a mobile quarterback as well, which you saw in a national title game. You saw that he can be. Now, what I learned this weekend was not the fact that Burroughs wasn't throwing, that there are other quarterbacks in this coming draft that are actually going to be very good and very mm -hmm. talented. Now, I do believe this is not a big quarterback class. You have Herbert, who looked very, very good. A lot of people don't like him as a quarterback, an NFL-style, prototypical NFL quarterback in this league. But he showed everybody that he can make every single throw. He's got an arm that he can throw 60 to 70 yards down the field. You saw it accurately. And the kid can move inside and out of the pocket, which right. he, he comes from Oregon. And Oregon is an organization, really a college, that likes to run the ball. They like to use a spread offense. They spread out four wide receivers, but they use the quarterback to run. That's what they do, and that's what Herbert is really good at. But what we saw at the Combine is the guy can make the throws. He's got a tremendous amount of athletic ability, and the guy can show you glimpses of a superstar quarterback in the NFL.
It's really, really interesting. When you think about James Dolan, everybody knows about the Charles Oakley thing and the fight between Charles Oakley and James Dolan and then the security guard and then Charles Oakley had to be escorted outside of Madison Square Garden. He went all over the media centers from ESPN to CBS to NBC speaking bad about James Dolan and the New York Knicks organization, how they never treated him with the proper respect that he deserves as an ex-New York Knicks and a big-time power forward that the Knicks had for their great years. You said of the he was 90s. your favorite player growing up. Yes, right? he was. Yeah. He was my favorite player mm-hmm. growing up. Uh, I loved his mean streak. I loved the fact that he went up there. He pushed people. He threw people. He was a true New Yorker. And he, he came from Chicago, from the Chicago Bulls and Michael Jordan. And really, he was the last piece the Knicks needed to be a championship competitive team. Now, I don't want to hear about Charles Smith and Xavier McDaniel and all the other players the Knicks had, the Charlie Wards, the, the Chris Childs, the Allen Houston's from the, 90, the late 90s. The importance of the New York Knicks organization from 1990 all the way up to 97 when the Knicks were at their best. The Knicks were great from 90 to really 96, 97. That was when the Knicks were a good team and they were a winning organization. They won almost 50 games every single year. They were in the playoffs every single year and they competed against Miami, Chicago, Orlando, the good teams of the Eastern Conference. When you look at James Dolan, I, I don't blame James Dolan for the Nick woes. I know a lot of fans like to blame him and say, well, because he's the owner of the team, the Knicks are never going to win. This has nothing to do with James Dolan. This particular thing with Charles Oakley and Spike Lee has everything to do with James Dolan. Does that keep away players from coming to play for the organization? It shouldn't. James Dolan opens his pockets. He pays for these players to play for his organization. He overpays players. He overpaid Tim Hardaway Jr. He has overpaid players to come over. Julius Randle for a three-year contract, even though I think they underpaid him. But for a guy that really had one good season, Julius Randle, what is he getting, $17 million a year? Mm. So when you look at James Dolan, he's not cheap. He's not the Will Ponds. So I don't want to hear that, oh, he's as bad as the Whale Punts. I want to get into this whole Aaron Judge situation with the New York Yankees. I know a lot of people will come out and say, well, you have to blame the trainers. You have to blame the doctors of the New York Yankees organization because they're the Yankees and they have the best doctors, the best trainers in the world. But in the last couple of years, especially the last two years, going into this year, Last year, the Yankees had 33 or 32 big-time injuries. That hurt the Yankees throughout the season. Now, did it show? No, the Yankees won 103 games in the regular season last year, and they went on to the American League Championship. And they lost against Houston in, what was it, five games? games, Six games? But obviously we know why. (laughs) Absolutely. But when you look at this particular injury, this is an injury that you have to shake your head. Because Aaron Judge has had this injury for almost four months And I'm not talking about four months going into this year. Four months last year in the regular season when he dove for a ball and he hurt his ribs. How many different CAT scans or MRIs or x-rays that they gave Aaron Judge in the last couple of months and it just didn't work out for the New York Yankees? And I, I know a lot of people are going to go over this and they're going to say, you have to look at the Yankees organization. They got to fire this guy. They got to fire this guy because they need to fix this problem. Now, this is a problem that might not be able to be fixed. And I understand they fired trainers in the last couple of weeks and they fired a bunch of doctors. But this has been going on for years. And the Yankees were not the team to be laughed at over the years. It was the Mets. But the Mets organization for year in and year out and with all the injuries they've had with you talk about Wheeler, you talk about Mats, you talk about Syndergaard, you even talk about the Grim Reaper. And I call him the Grim Reaper because he's no longer with the New York Mets and he had his rib taken out just like they're talking about possibly Aaron Judge getting one of his ribs taken out. And you know who I'm talking about, the Dark Knight. And you look at the Yankees organization as a whole. This is an organization that's they have done nothing but win. But I don't even know if this Yankee team this year can withstand the injuries that they maintained last year in the regular season. Now there are stories coming out of the Minnesota Vikings that Minnesota might be interested in trading Kirk Cousins. Now if that's the case... And Cousins has two years left on his contract. No, he has one. And Kyle Shanahan, who was his offensive coordinator when he was over there in Washington with his father, Mike Shanahan, and losing in the Super Bowl against a team that you were up by almost 10 points with seven minutes left of the game, maybe he thinks that Jimmy Garoppolo isn't the quarterback of the future of the San Francisco 49ers. But it beats the hell out of me. Why would you give him $130 million when he became a 49er? If you didn't think 
that Jimmy Garoppolo was worth the money that you gave him. And I don't think they really did. And they're talking about Dak Prescott, the Dallas Cowboys, and Dak Prescott's agent right now is talking about getting Dak the biggest contract in NFL history for a quarterback. And Dak Prescott, even though he had a great sensational year, statistically, the Cowboys didn't make the playoffs. And you have to look at that. You you always look at the quarterback. Is he going to take you to the playoffs every single year? Is he going to give you a chance to win every single year? If you ask me, Jimmy Garoppolo has answered those questions the last couple of years. Now, he's coming off a big, significant injury. He tore his ACL and MCL. And he's coming back from a significant injury. And coming back from his injury, he took him to a Super Bowl. Now, they lost in the Super Bowl against, to me, the better quarterback and the better team. But when you're talking about the offseason right now, Tom Brady has been in conversation with the 49ers, trading Jimmy Garoppolo back to the Patriots and bringing in Tom Brady because Tom Brady is a 49ers fan. He grew up a 49ers fan, a Joe Montana fan. He wants to bring a championship home to the 49ers before he retires. And he wants to win a championship without Mm -hmm. a Bill Belichick. And now you're talking about Kirk Cousins, which I believe that's Kyle Shanahan's number one target. Why is it his number one target? Because Kirk Cousins knows his offense. Kirk Cousins knows how to throw the ball in his offense. Maybe Jimmy doesn't. Jimmy played well, but again, they had a very good running game this year. They had one of the best running games in football. Number two overall, yeah. They had a three-headed monster, and they ran the ball probably about 70% of the time. They didn't depend on Jimmy Garoppolo's arm. And if you watch the Minnesota Vikings, they did depend on Kirk Cousins' arm this year. Now, I'm not saying Kirk Cousins is better than Jimmy Garoppolo. I don't know. I am not a coach, and I'm not a GM. But in Kyle Shanahan's eyes, obviously he believes Kirk Cousins is a better quarterback than Jimmy Garoppolo. And numbers will show you that Kirk Cousins is one of the top five, top seven quarterbacks in the league in the last three years. 